when Laura was explaining to me uh, what family formation was, and that we met once a month, and there was a speaker that gave a talk. Um, in my youth and in my stupidity, I said that I would do all of them. So here I am. And, uh, and so I'm actually looking forward to it. Um, I've had over a month to repair. And I'm a super procrastinator, so you can probably guess when I've prepared. So uh, I do better that way, right? That's what we all say. Um, as, I, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about teachers specifically. Anybody, anybody seen the movie The School of Rock? You know, what, uh, you know what he says about teachers in the School of Rock? Teachers are people who, who can't do, and those who can't, sorry. Yeah, teachers are people who can't do teach, and those who can't teach, teach PE. That's what, they, that's what he says. <clears throat> so I guess I should teach PE other than, other than this. But. So what I thought, what I thought I'd do the, throughout this year, we meet seven times, including tonight. And so what I thought I would do is I'd kind of do a walk through the catechism. And when we hear that word catechism, it may bring up some hardness uh, of heart. Maybe it's like, oh man, just a constant teaching, a constant uh, boring uh, taught uh, teaching by Father. And that may be the case. But I hope, I hope in this time to be able to open your hearts and your minds to the way in which I was formed, not when I was uh, growing up, uh, but when I was formed in college, because for me, the faith was a bunch of rules, and it was a bunch of rules that we had to follow, and uh, I had to follow it, because if I didn't, I knew that when I got home, I'd get an earful or grounded from mom and dad, and so, uh, so college was a period of time, at least for a short amount of time, a period of time uh, which exhibited some rebellion, some rebellion against just the lack of freedom under my parents. Um, but there was never a falling away from the faith. I was blessed enough to uh, have a solid enough foundation that I knew that uh, I, I, could, I should never fall away. And so Mass was always a constant for me. Uh, confession, when I needed it, uh, was, was a constant for me. But, but I wasn't living, I was living more of a double life. I was doing the things I needed to do uh, on Sunday. Saturdays and Sundays, Saturdays because when, that's when confession was, but during the week uh, and on Friday nights and Saturday nights, I was not doing the things that, that I should have been doing. And so uh, I hope to invite you into this journey into the catechism. Since it's only seven times, we can't get into it in depth uh, a ton, and, but, but we ho I hope to dive into it uh, pretty decently just to kind of whet your appetite and, um, and, and for you to actually dive into some study yourself. So, does anybody know what the definition of catechism is? I didn't either. I had to look it up, so don't. <laughs> the de definition of catechism is a summary of the principles of Christian religion in the form of questions and answers used for the instruction of Christians. And so tonight I want to spend all, most of the night talking about the history of catechisms in the life of the church. And then I want to dive into the first few paragraphs of, of the catechism itself tonight. And I have these stacks of books here because uh, they'll, they'll become examples uh, throughout. So the very first catechism that was ever written in the life of the church is a document, actually. It's a very short document written somewhere between 65 A.D. and 80 A.D. So Jesus died in 33 A.D., and then uh, St. Paul, I forget about the time that St. Paul was converted, but he began writing his letters. And then there began, then there was this document uh, called the Didache. Didache, Didache, uh, however you say it. And the Didache is a document, it's called the Teaching of the Apostles. And it's, it's the very, very first catechism, because what it does is it outlines the teachings of the early church. So it is, now this is pretty small writing, um, but it's really literally 18 paragraphs is all it is. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's really small, mostly because the church was still being developed. They had their liturgy. They had uh, the four things that Acts 2.42 says that the apostles devoted themselves to. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of the bread, uh, the prayers, and to fellowship. 
And so they were already doing these things, but then they began to see that it was going to be good for them to begin compiling what it is that they actually believe. And so as St. Paul is writing his letters and affirming the faith in communities, but also correcting the belief of some in those communities as well, they knew that it was going to be a good thing because all the apostles and all of the followers of the apostles were beginning to die and be martyred, and, and the persecution was beginning to spread even more as Christianity began to be spreading more. They knew, that they, they knew that they needed something that was going to teach the essentials of the faith. And so this, this Didache was, was written. So it sets out in a rather systematic way the beliefs, practices, and moral imperatives of the early Christians. And so if we just look at some of the titles of, of the paragraphs, it will kind of give you an idea as to... Uh, as to what, what it's about. So the first uh, paragraph is called The Way of Life. And the very first sentence says, There are two ways, a way of life and a way of death, and the difference between these two ways is great. The way of life is this, Thou shalt love first the Lord thy Creator, and secondly thy neighbor as thyself, and thou shalt do nothing to any man that thou wouldst not wish to be done to thyself. So the very first thing that the Didache talks about then is the golden rule, right? Love God uh, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Then kind of the, the second uh, section uh, talks about the way of death, so it talks about the way of life and then the way of death. Then it goes on to on baptism, fasting and prayer, on the Eucharist. And what I, when I read this for the very first time, uh, when it got to this part on the Eucharist and got to the part on the Mass, when you start to read it, you're just like, how that is amazing that within 30 years of Christ dying, the Mass began to develop and already began to be very similar uh, to what we do in the Mass today. And if we get to uh, St. Justin Martyr, when you start reading St. Justin Martyr, who, who wrote about 150, uh, he's talking about the Mass, and it's the exact same parts that we say in the Mass today. And so our Mass has been handed down to us from Jesus, from the Last Supper, all the way to us in the same manner throughout all of these centuries. And it's, it's beautiful, beautiful for us, for us to be able to, to see that. Then it's on the apostles and the prophets, on the, on the Lord's Day, on Sunday worship, uh, local officials, eschatology, which means speaking about in the end times, and then that's it. So it's extremely short, but, it's, but it talks about all of these things that we believe as, as Catholics. So after the Didache kind of becomes the fathers of the church, so uh, from about 100, uh, and there's different groups of the fathers of the church, but the fathers of the church, the very early fathers of the church, fathers are a group of the foundational members of the early Christian church. But they often set out a series of catechetical instructions to be used mainly in baptismal preparation. So just like most of you, when you brought your kids to be baptized, father probably spent some time with you doing some baptismal prep, or Jeannie spent some time with you doing some baptismal prep. Um, but also, if you're a convert, you spent time in RCIA, which was that preparation for your baptism, for your coming into the church. So St. Augustine was kind of the one uh, big promoter, and he lived from 354 to 430, that wrote uh, kind of a catechism. Uh, actually, it was called the De Catechizandis Rudibus. Which, uh, which the actual title means, How to Catechize the Ignorant. That's what it's called. So it linked salvation history to faith, to hope, and ultimately to charity. So it was this catechism that he wrote that he sent out and expected people to do a baptismal preparation with the people that were desiring to come into the church. And remember, uh, during, the, during the first two or three uh, hundred years of, of the church, they were all under persecution. Uh, Christianity was illegal. It wasn't until Constantine that Christianity was legalized, and that then when it became legalized, it began, began to be uh, spread even more quickly. But to come into the church in the first three, uh, first three centuries, you actually spent many years in preparation. Number one, to give you the right teaching. Number, you, number two, to give you the courage that you needed to go to be a martyr, because more than likely you're going to be a martyr. And thirdly, to make sure that you weren't a spy, that you weren't a spy, a spy for the Roman government in which they were trying to infiltrate Christianity in order to take it down. And so, so they tried to root, root all of that out. So these people that were being prepared for bap baptism were expected to provide instructions 
in the faith to their children, supplemented by homilies in the church. So just like you bring, you teach your children at home uh, the faith, and you're supposed to take what you learned throughout all the years that you were in, in catechism or in Catholic school, you're meant to hand that on to your children. And just like we're doing this family formation, it's meant for you to take the opportunity to sit down with your children, to spend time with them, to teach them the faith. It's been proven over and over and over and over again. Even if you drop your kids off at our Catholic school, even if you drop your kids off on, on our Wednesday night uh, faith formation program, the faith will not be passed on unless parents are talking about it in the home. Parents are the primary educators of the children. If it's not happening in the home, it's not going to happen. Uh, what they will do is they'll be catechized by all of the culture and they won't be catechized by the parents in the home. So it's very, very important, and the church has understood this from the very beginning, that the faith is, the faith is transmitted in the home. And so that's why St. Augustine had this expectation that when he gave these documents, when he gave these catechisms uh, in order, uh, when he gave the catechisms to the people who are going to be baptized, that's why he then continued to form them so that then they could pass it on to their children again. Skipping ahead to uh, St. Gregory the Great, who lived from 540 to 604, he wrote what's called the Books of Dialogue, which expressed the proper way of handing down the faith as well as giving people the content of the faith. So these people also that were coming into the church once again, uh, he, he wrote these books of dialogue in order to make sure that it was the proper faith that was being handed down. There were heresies, things that were being taught contrary to the faith during all of this time, so they were trying to hand down the true faith uh, from all of these times. He also, St. Gregory the Great was uh, the first pope to ever be named Great, um, and, he was, and he was named this because he was a prolific writer. He also wrote uh, the pastoral regulations for priests and bis bishops and gave many, many catechetical homilies. So homilies tended to be very long in the early days because it was meant to supplement the education that, that parents were giving their children at home, also was meant to uh, educate uh, the parents who were coming to Mass as well. What eventually happened was that uh, many people were Ill illiterate, and so the actual reading of the faith uh, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't uh, really possible. Uh, printing was extremely expensive. You had to literally uh, copy by hand, if you wanted a book, copy it by hand from one to the next, and so it was extremely expensive. Paper was expensive. It's very difficult to, to spread the faith, to spread the catechisms uh, before the Gutenberg Press, which was invented approximately around, 14, around 1450. And so the catechetical instruction often came from the living word passed on in families and in liturgies. So it wasn't, it wasn't handed on by reading something. It wasn't handed on by going through a textbook with someone. It was literally handed on by the way that they lived out their life together as a family. It was passed on by the, by the way in which they sat down together and prayed by the way that they sat down together and actually talked about the faith, uh, by going to the church, by going and he listening to the homilies, and being catechized in that manner. Scripture readings and sermons were often long in order to catechize, as I said. They also became a source of fascination and enjoyment. Because there wasn't TV or radio, uh, it, also, it became an opportunity for them to socialize as well. And so not only uh, was going to Mass at an, an event in order to worship God and, and, to, and to be able to um, be catechized, but it was an opportunity for socialization as well. So as the church began to build cathedrals and churches, they began to be what they called living catechisms. So because when you go into these huge cathedrals, especially over in Europe and around Jerusalem, uh, in the Middle East, um, you, be, you see these huge churches, and these huge churches have, would have stained glass windows. They've had these beautiful statues, and everything the statue is doing had all these symbolisms to talk about who they were and, and talk about the faith. Uh, they have beautiful, beautiful paintings. Uh, the first time that I, that I went to uh, Assisi, which is where St. Francis is from, um, in the church, in the Basilica of St. Francis, there's these huge paintings along the walls up, uh, up along the top. And you go in, and every single one is just a scene from Scripture 
or a, a scene from the life of the apostles or a scene from, from St. Francis' life because all of it was meant to catechize the illiterate people who were coming and, and coming to pilgrimage uh, in, in these churches. But it was also an opportunity for the priest who was saying Mass and preaching to be able to point out these paintings and be able to explain to them that this is a story of, of this in the Bible or this is a story of what Francis St. Francis did. Um, but is able to pass on the faith in that manner. And so this became very important in the life of the church, and still to this day, this is why we build beautiful churches. This is why we put in beautiful stained glass. This is why we use statues. This is why we use paintings. Always, always to, to be able to pass on the faith from us to the next generation. After, during, during the time of the Gutenberg Press, there were, there were missionary saints such as St. Saint Bede, St. Alcuin, St. Boniface, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, these were the great catechists sharing the content of the faith uh, by their teaching and preaching. During the 1300s, there is many religious orders. Some of the uh, most famous mendicant, the mendicant means that they went out, which was ver versus the, uh, the cloistered, which means that they stayed home. Uh, but the Franciscans, Dominicans, Carmelites began to be mendicant order orders. Uh, religious orders, they arose in the Middle Ages in order to spread the faith effectively and to be catechized and, were, and catechized to bring a greater knowledge to those who already believed. So one of the greatest things about St. Francis was that, number one, I don't know if you know this, St. Francis was never a priest. Uh, he never thought he was worthy to be a priest. He was ordained a deacon, but he began to be one of the famous and one of the most prolific evangelizers in the life of the church because he would go and preach. He'd preach on street corners or he'd preach by the way that he lived his life or the things that he did. There's phenomenal stories about St. Francis. So when he would go into towns, if a town wouldn't listen to him, uh, there's stories about how he'd begin preaching to the birds because nobody in the town would listen to him. And the birds would gather around him and, and listen to him. The Dominicans, uh, when you see an OP behind the name of a Dominican, it literally means the order of preachers. So they were the ones going out and preaching. They were specifically dedicated to sharing and teaching the faith wherever they went. And the Carmelites, uh, the same way. You'll hear of Carmelites today that live cloistered lives. And so there's, there's two types of uh, Carmelites today. Those who go out and preach and teach, but also those who live a, a life of solitude and live in, a, live in a monastery in order to pray for the world. During the Reformation, catechesis began to change. Uh, part of the reason uh, of this was because of the ignorant clergy. Uh, many clergy were from kind of a lower class who w didn't know how to read. Uh, there was no proper seminary formation. And so they just didn't know the faith. They didn't know proper catechesis. And thus, they weren't able to have a, a, an education in theological formation as we get in seminaries today. So when Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses or uh, the 95 uh, Theses on the Disputation on the Power and Ethics of, the, of Indulgences on the, ca on the church door of the Castle of Wittenberg in 1517, uh, because of the lack of theological formation that priests, and, that priests tended to have, it was, it was easy for them to lose an argument. They're, they had no way in which to, in which to defend the faith. And so uh, the faith was quickly attacked. People quickly fell away from the faith. And you have to remember that there was no such thing as other denominations in the Christian faith up until this time, up until 1517. Well, Anglicanism started a little bit before this. But before that, there was nothing. It was all one unified Christianity as Jesus intended for it to be, as he prayed for in uh, John 17, that all may be one as you, Father, and I are one. But this lack of theological formation for many clergy made fertile the soil for attacks against the faith. Large numbers of bishops, clergy, and lay people were led astray for many reasons, but also because of the failure to grasp in a systematic, organic, and complete way the realities of the Catholic faith. And that's the kind of formation that we get in, in, the, in the life of seminary today. Martin Luther was very skilled at propaganda, and also he was very skilled at using the printing press. And so he was able to publish quickly his arguments against the faith, and spread them throughout Germany and beyond very quickly. Uh, St. Peter Canisius formulated the standard procedure for catechetical activity and what he called a major catechism. So if you've seen the green catechism uh, today, this is what they would call a major catechism. Um, a major catechism because a thick volume 
of all the teachings of the things that we believe as Catholics. So the one that he compri comprised w would, have been, would have been different than this one. But it was, exhaust it was an exhaustive compendium of the teaching of the faith. He also then issued smaller versions in a question and answer format uh, so that they could be uh, diffused amongst the people in, in a quicker fashion in order to be able to begin to fight the heresies of Martin Luther during that time. The Council of Trent was, a, was, in, was held in response to Martin Luther and the Reformation. Councils in the life of the church are established to study, argue, and determine doctrine in the dogmas of the faith. So the very first council that you might be familiar with, but you wouldn't think of it as a council, is actually the Council of Jerusalem, which was held um, around, oh, what was it, 40, 50 A.D., something like that. It was, it was the argument on circumcision. Do the Gentiles have to be circumcised when they come into the church? And so we actually can read about it in the Acts of the Apostles to hear about how they can, came to the conclusion there. 15, in 1556, uh, the, the, a catechism was drafted in order to, to communicate the realization that all Christian knowledge and eternal life is to know Jesus Christ, and that to know Christ is to keep his commandments, and to know that charity is the end of the commandments and the fulfillment of the law. So the Roman catechism, or the, uh, the catechism of the Council of Trent, was published in 1565 and began to be the catechism that was used uh, for everything, uh, up until, uh, actually up until this one was printed. And so, uh, so think about that. From 1565 up until 1994, um, that was the catechism that was used uh, for all of that time. So what happened from that catechism of the Council of Trent is little catechisms in countries uh, were, then, were then provided. In 1884, the bishops of the United States began working on the catechism that we know of uh, as today as the Baltimore Catechism. Has anybody, anybody uh, received their religious ed from the Baltimore Catechism? I did. Uh, a little bit. My mom was my teacher for many of my years, and so, uh, so we used some of this. So if you've seen this, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's newer versions today. Uh, they, they've reprinted them, and, uh, and they're a little prettier now. Uh, but, uh, but you can still get them. And they're, they're very concise. They're in the question and answer format. Uh, they give very simple answers. Uh, there's, there's different levels. Uh, there's four volumes. And, there, and in those different levels, uh, level one is for, for younger kids. Level two moves up uh, into more uh, uh, middle school to, to junior high. And uh, three and four, three would probably be for high school. Four would probably be for adults. But, but they pass on and they go on in that way. So Baltimore was the very first diocese in the United States, and so it, began, it was named the Baltimore Catechism after the gathering of the bishops in 1884 in order to comprise this catechism, which, it, which was published in 1885. And so this began to be the staple for all catechesis in the United States from 1885 up until uh, 1994. So this was the next catechism that was actually printed. There's many versions of the Baltimore Catechism that are printed. You can find this one, but you, then you can find other, um, other priests and bishops who began to, to print uh, other forms of it. Um, but they're all based off of the, the Tridentine Catechism, or the, uh, the Roman Catechism from the Council of Trent, which then, are based, which then all the other ones are based on the Baltimore Catechism as well. So much of the systematic catechesis after Vatican II uh, disintegrated, unfortunately, and the faith was no longer taught, and much confusion ensued. Now, I didn't obviously live around the time of Vatican II, um, but somewhat of a product of it, because I was born in 1981. And during that time, so today, when Laura goes to choose textbooks for religious ed, or we choose textbooks uh, for the Catholic school, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops actually has an entire list of approved books that we can choose from for uh, our religious education here in the parish. In the 80s, that didn't exist. And so what happened was that uh, many, of, uh, many things got to be printed that were actually uh, wrong and actually literally contrary to the faith. Uh, many of the religious ed books that, that were used taught what I like to, what I like to call kumbaya uh, relig religious ed because it was just touchy-feely and, and it never gave any depth 
to what we believe as Catholics. And so uh, the faith uh, began to be attacked again, especially in the United States, uh, probably uh, because of that. So in 1985, Pope John Paul II called an extraordinary synod of bishops in order to commemorate the closing of the Second Vatican Council. But the purpose of this was to discuss the effect that the council had had on the universal church in the last 25, in the last 20 years since it had closed. So a proposal from actually an American cardinal uh, was asked of the extraordinary synod of bishops to come up with a catechism for the entirety of the church. And so the example that he used was that in America they're wearing jeans and in, uh, in South America they're wearing jeans. Everybody kind of has this commonality, so can we get a common catechism that the entire church can use? And so it took them from uh, John Paul II, when he released the document from that extraordinary synod of bishops, it took from that time, which was about 1986 or 87, until 1994 for them uh, to actually compile it, at least for the English-speaking world. It was first actually published in French because it was... Uh, Cardinal uh, Christoph Schoenborn, uh, an uh, Austrian bishop who actually was the editor of, of, the, uh, of the catechism, uh, but a, bunch of, a whole bunch of bishops actually contributed and priests contributed to make it what it is. So, but the very first volume was printed in, in 1994. And it's had, I think it's in its third um, edition now, because there were some things that accidentally got left out and some, thing, some changes that were made. And so the very first volume is actually has a brown cover. Uh, the second volume has a green cover, and I believe there's a, the third volume now has a blue cover. And so, as you can see, it's super, sit, super thick. So you've seen the green ones. You maybe have seen the white ones that are, that are printed in a smaller version. Um, some people need readers to see these. I don't yet. Give me 10 years or less. And then um, I found this one. This is the one that I really like. It's also small writing, but it's kind of more of a vinyl cover, and um, it's green, um, and it's just the uh, paper is actually, it's thinner than this one. It's easier to carry around, and, uh, and so I really like this one. It's actually printed by the bishops of Australia. It's not printed in the United States. And so um, I saw someone that had it, and I loved it, and so I asked where they got it, and I got one as well. So... So John Paul II, when promulgating the catechism, said this. A catechism must present faithfully and organically the teaching of sacred scripture, the living tradition of the church, and the authentic magisterium, as well as the spiritual heritage of the faith of God's people. It must take into account the presentations of doctrine which the Holy Spirit has entrusted to the church over the centuries. It must also help to illumine with the light of faith the new situations and problems which have not been posed in the past. The Catechism, therefore, contains both the new and the old, for the faith is always the same and the source of ever new lights. And so that's from the document that uh, allowed this to be published, uh, called Fide Depositum, which means the deposit of faith. And actually that document is in the front of this Catechism as well. So the catechism itself is, is made up of four parts. The first part is the creed, the second part is the sacraments, the third part is the commandments, and the fourth part is on prayer. So it does the exact thing that John Paul II was actually hoping that it would do, that it, that it blends scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, and the spiritual heritage of the church all in one uh, large volume. The first thing that characterizes the catechism of the Catholic Church is its principle of unity. The Catechism presents an organized synthesis of the foundations and a central content of Catholic doctrine as regards both faith and morals. Unity is the most important principle and is one of the marks of the Church itself. So there's actually four marks of the Church, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. We recite that in the Creed every single Sunday to remind ourselves of, the, of that importance of that uh, every single week. But that perfect kind of unity that makes us both, excuse me, Unity is the most important principle and is one of the marks of the church itself. This does not mean dull uniformity, but that perfect kind of unity that makes us one, both in time and in space. So the, the, there's one faith throughout the entire world. There's a billion Catholics throughout the entire world. We have one faith, but not just those who are living, 
we also have to remember that those who have died still are holding on to the faith and have the perfection of faith in eternal life. We also recognize with this oneness of faith that if there is a conflict between the culture and the gospel, it's not the gospel that is wrong, it's not the gospel that needs to change, but it's the culture that needs to change. So it's important for us to incorporate the gospel into our lives so that then we can then transform uh, the culture. The second principle that guides the catechism of the Catholic Church is what the Second Vatican Council calls the hierarchy of truths. This does not mean that there is some kind of principle of subtraction, and namely that there are some essentials in the faith and the rest is left to free discussion, or that it can be dismissed as not significant. That's what we call cafeteria Catholicism, when we see one thing is important, but we see that the others are not, so we take what we like and we throw away what we don't like. We take what we like about love and mercy, but we throw away the things uh, about, uh, about the mor morality of our life that, uh, that we, don't want, to, that we want, don't want to adhere to. We see this, I've seen this a lot in my, in my nine years as a priest, people that like to just throw part out and, and keep the other part. What the hierarchy of truth means is that there is a principle of organic structure in the intellectual formation of the faith. The mystery of the Blessed Trinity in, this, in the central place of Christ, as well as the creed, sacraments, commandments, and prayer, are the way in which the catechism forms a common structure. Christ, the incarnate Word and Son of God, is taught. And everything else is taught with reference to Him, and it is Christ alone who teaches. I, I love that phrase. Christ, the incarnate Word and Son of God, is taught. So the entire point of the catechism is that we are teaching Christ. Everything else, everything else that is taught in the catechism is in reference to Him, and it is Him alone who teaches. Anyone else teaches only to the extent that He is Christ's spokesman. So even me standing up here teaching, and it's not me up here teaching, I'm only teaching what Christ has given us to teach. So it is Him who teaches us even tonight, enabling Christ to teach through my lips. Every catechist should be able to apply to himself the words of Jesus. My teaching is not mine, but of that, but that of Him who sent me. The first and last point of reference for a catechesis will always be Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life we hear in John 14. By looking to Jesus in faith, faithful Christians can hope that he will fulfill his promises in them. And finally, the Holy Father writes, in introducing the new catechism to the world, he says this, It is a sure and authentic source book. It's a sure and authentic source book for the teaching of Catholic doctrine, especially for the composition of local catechisms. It is also offered to the faithful who want to understand better the inexhaustible riches of salvation. It seeks to give support to ecumenical efforts, motivated, motivated by the desire for the unity of all Christians, by demonstrating with precision the content and harmonious coherence of the Catholic faith. The Catechism of the Catholic Church finally is offered to everyone who asks the reason for the hope that is in us and who would like to know what the Catholic Church believes. The Catechism helps us to understand our faith, to be able to give us the reason for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So it's important that we know it. The interesting thing about the uh, Catechism is that uh, it's not actually written for lay people, which I find kind of funny because we tell people to read it. Um, I, and I do think it's a phenomenal uh, book to have on our shelf and to read. Uh, it's actually written for bishops, priests, and catechists to help to give them an understanding of the faith, to help them then to take what is in here and be able to teach it to those whom they are teaching. And so, but we all have a, a brain and we've all been taught very well. We have the, the ability to reason. And so technically we are all catechists. You are all catechists because you are parents. And so in some ways it's for you to use as well. I believe that every Catholic should have it on their shelf for their ability to be able to go to it to find all the answers. So anything that is taught, any institution that is teaching something, we can always go back to the catechism to be able to find if it's orthodox teaching or not, if it's true to the church or not. If, if it doesn't align with what's in the catechism, then it is not aligning with what the Catholic Church teaches. And finally, beginning and diving in to the very elements of the catechism, very briefly. 
When someone asks you what we believe as Catholics, what do you tell them? When I was a focused missionary at the University of Nebraska, maybe I've told this story, on Thursday nights they would have what they called community night. And community night was an opportunity, we'd have late mass, I believe it was 9 o'clock, and then we'd have an event down in the hall with food and games and stuff like that. It's just an opportunity for college kids to hang out, have some fun together, and, um, and just spend some time uh, late at night uh, just hanging out rather than going to the bars or, or doing anything stupid. But one night after Mass, before community night, I was kind of hanging out outside the chapel. Uh, I just kind of stayed after a little bit to pray. And I was out there, and this uh, young woman walks up, and she says, uh, well, what, what do you guys believe? She said, I, I've been kind of going around to the different churches around, and she says, I've been asking everybody, what do they believe? <clears throat> Me being the missionary uh, should have had the answer, but I stumbled over my words. I was looking straight at the tabernacle right in front of us, which I could have said, believe that Jesus became man and died for our sins. That's what I could have said and should have said. But I said probably... Uh, Maybe I'm the only one that would say this. But probably what most Catholics would say, we believe in good morals and stuff. <laughs> Those are my literal words. The first thing that came out of my mouth was the rules. And been so ingrained in me my entire life that uh, and it's, it's not my parents' fault. It's, it's really not. It's the way that I... Uh, mistook it, and, uh, and the way that even in college when it began to transform how I believed and, and what I was going to do with my life, I knew that it wasn't about rules. But in the moment, you just freeze, and you say the first thing that comes to mind. That was all that came to mind, and uh, I felt terrible. still kind of am embarrassed by it and still feel terrible about it. But, uh, but that's often the first thing that comes to our mind. But the first paragraph of the Catechism reveals something very different. The point of our faith is not about obeying a bunch of rules. It really isn't. Our, our faith is about what the Catechism says in paragraph 1. God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. He calls together all men, scattered and divided by sin, into the unity of his family, the church. To accomplish this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son as Redeemer and Savior. In his Son and through him, he invites men to become, in the Holy Spirit, his adopted children and thus heirs of his blessed life. Did we hear anything about rules in that paragraph? Not a word. Our faith, who we are as Catholics, is all about recognizing how God, who is so perfect, how he loves so much, desires to pour himself out in love, and he has this tremendous, infinite plan for us in our lives. And he wants to share that plan with us. And he invites us to be a part of his blessed life because he is blessed in himself. That's what we hear. And so from the very moment of our creation, it goes on to say that he's constantly seeking us. He's constantly seeking us so we may know him and so that we may love him. We are also seeking Him. Hopefully, we are seeking Him with all of who that we are. St. Augustine says that our heart is restless until it rests in Thee, O Lord. If you've ever had a restless heart, if you've ever had a time in which you just can't seem to get things right, it's because we're ultimately seeking the most stable thing that we can find, which is God himself, who has created us, who is blessed, who is love, who is mercy, 
and who has poured himself out for us. And so he calls us all together, even though, we've been, even though we sin. He calls us into this unity of his family, the church. And through the church, through the ministry of the church, we are forgiven of our sins and we are brought into eternal life. And so my intent throughout these seven sessions that we have is to hopefully introduce you not to the rules of the Catholic Church. Most of you probably know the rules of the Catholic Church and you're tired of hearing them. But I want to introduce you to the blessed life that God is in himself and that blessed life in which he calls each and every single one of us to. And so through these seven months... I invite you back into this journey and hopefully I'll have something good to say <laughs> over these next seven months. So thank you uh, for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Laura's got a few uh, exclamations.